Hi, everyone. Welcome to Forbes Talks. I'm with Amy Feldman, my colleague who is senior editor and has written a terrific piece, Amy, on basically the new CEO of FTX, John Ray. Tell us, first of all, about um, the nature of what he does. These turnaround experts are not your classic CEO. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Diane, first of all. And, and yes, they're not at all your classic CEO. I mean, John Ray is somebody who, he's an attorney who got into the restructuring business. And he's the kind of person who, in a sense, pilots into a distressed situation as the person who's going to clean up the mess. And is cleaning up the mess basically mean you go in, you know, don't have to motivate the employees. It's all about maximizing, finding what can be sold um, and essentially returning as much money to creditors as possible? Or what does success look like? Maybe many different things in this situation. I mean, I think it looks like many different things. I mean, I think the first thing he has to do is figure out exactly what's there. So, you know, there was, as he, as he talked about in his first filing last week, this complete lack of controls at FTX, which has been written about a lot. And so first he has to find out well, what, what assets are there? Who works there? Who does he want to work there? Like, what are these businesses? In one of the filings, he talks about there being more than 100 affiliates. So first he has to get a handle on that and then figure out what's operational, what can be salvaged, how do you get the assets in a place where they're safe, and then return what you can to creditors. Can you talk a little bit about what you've gleaned about him as a person? Because I know that he's got a track record, especially when we look at this, you know, to say worst, you know, hyperbolic comments, having been an Enron and many um, situations like that. How did he get his start? You know, what's his background? He got his start. I mean, originally, he he grew up in Western Massachusetts. He's more of a, a blue collar guy, but then he he got a law degree and he became the general counsel of Fruit of the Loom. And Fruit of the Loom, as you as you may recall, since we're around the same age, had a spectacular bankruptcy. And so he was the person who who ended up in the center of that bankruptcy. And from there, ended up moving into this on a repeated basis. And so he worked on Enron most, you know, most prominently, but he also worked on overseas shipholding, on Nortel, on a bunch of other distressed and, and, and troubled companies that, that went into chapter 11. One of the things that struck me in the article you wrote was, you know, we had this, you know, complete lack of control and this um, almost not fear mongering, but certainly very strong words. It appears that um, he actually found, you know, surprisingly good companies or, or maybe surprisingly good parts of the operation in there. Is that correct? I mean, I think it's it, it's interesting. I mean, you're pointing out the difference between what he said in that first filing and then what he said over the weekend, um, which was that there were some businesses that had value and that he had, you know, subject to court approval, hired and investment bank to try to sell or restructure the businesses that had value. So, you know, one of the things that I've covered these turnaround specialists too, I, and, and um, there is a bit of theater, it seems to be around on, on these situations. You've got a high profile case. You've got a lot of angry creditors in swoops, the turnaround expert. And by the very nature of who they are, they have to be somewhat of a public figure, right? So, can you give me some sense of how is he engaging all through filings? Do you get any sense that he's actually talking to employees in a way that's not, I'm a lawyer and I'm I'm here to find out what you did wrong? I mean, what? give me some sense of that. And that's an interesting situation. I mean, unlike some of the other people who swoop in, he actually has an extremely low profile for this type of person. Um, almost no, you know, online... Uh, visibility, only really one public photograph of him over the, you know, he's 63, you would think he would have like a, a, a huge track record publicly. He, he's very, very well known within his world, but he's not actually that high profile outside of it. How, can you walk us through the process a little bit, Amy, of how do you recover, um, especially in a situation that's not a public company, what what's the actual sort of day-to-day -day tasks that he has to do at this point? 
And I think I think the first task, and I'm sort of you know simplifying, but you find out where the assets are at first, and then you figure out how to secure them. So in, in FTX's case, it has all these coins and it's working with third-party exchanges, including its own exchange, which you know has collapsed. So how do you find out if you can um, get those, assuming they have any value, maybe they do, maybe they don't, into a safe spot? And how do you um, figure out who's going to who's going to work there and and who's not? Over the weekend, there was a story that you know um, the other people who were obviously the top executives, along with SBF, he's fired them. They're out. Um, so you, he has to figure out who's trustworthy and who's not in order to um, you know find out what's there at this business and what can be saved. I think the 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 Enron example is interesting because he, you know, came in and it was obviously this this massive blow up and there were fraud charges filed against the founder and the CEO and the CEO went to prison for 12 years over that. And he managed to get back over 50 cents on the dollar for creditors, which was absolutely not expected. Which which raises the interesting question of of who do you work for? And of course, you know, ideally you're working for the owners and the creditors, but you know, simultaneously, if there does end up being a criminal probe, that changes the nature of the game and what you're looking for. Um, is there some sense that, you know, at this point it feels like it's still um, at, under investigation like everything else? Um, how does that shift the activities and and is he really, at this point, looking for where's the money and how do we get it back? I mean, I think those those investigations at this point are all, you know, very nascent. And as you mentioned, I mean, there's the SEC is looking, the Department of Justice is looking, everybody is is looking when something blows up this spectacularly and $8 billion is um, not there. There's obviously going to be massive investigations. I think he would work with those investigators, uh, you know, it, it, in a sense, it becomes like a, a parallel track. So you've got the criminal investigation, if there is to be one, and you've got the the creditors and the and any civil litigation. You, your um, headline is uh, the adult in the, is this a company <laughs> that, I mean, we obviously know the age of uh, Sam Bankman Freed and his colleagues. Were there other signs that this was a company that was perhaps didn't have adults in the room besides I, the ex implosion of the, you know, exchange I, itself? I think so. I mean, I think the, the ages and the, the implosion, you know, it, it is obviously clear that the adults weren't in the room. There was one detail in that filing last week that struck me as being very indicative, even though it was small, which was that... Um, Expense reports and, and and all expenses were signed off with emojis in chat, which um, is is obviously not how a a, a grown up or you know publicly traded or even a venture back company should be operating. Let's hope he knows how to use those emojis right and decipher them. So so what are you looking <laughs> what what are you looking for from here? Because um, on average, is is there an average stint in terms of how long he stayed in companies like this? If you're a if you're a cleanup artist, you're not there to build a career. You're not, but these things take a long time. And and, and when I was talking with people who've worked with him before and who've been in this field for a long time, they say this is this takes years. I mean, Enron took you know ten years. This could take. 10 years, more than 10 years to finish, whether he would be there for the whole thing or not, obviously is, is, you know, an open question, but he would stay certainly up to the point that, um, it, it, that things are cleaned up, that someone else could step in, or this could be wrapped up. You know, one of the things that happened on Twitter was that when SBF, which he since stopped, had a bit of a stream of a consciousness, um, you know, uh, exposition you might call it or or certainly his views of what he wants to do with the company and then you know um the current ceo stepped in and said you are no you know he no longer represents uh ftx what uh, what kind of relationship does he or, or will he be expected to have um given his background with sbf you know i mean because obviously the critical you know i suppose the critical 
part of information is going to come from him. I mean, he's the repository. That's the word I was looking for. He was the board. He was the expense manager. He So to a certain extent, can you freeze somebody like that out of the company when you're trying to recover gains? That's an interesting question. And I, I really don't know the answer to that. that. That raises an interesting point when you have someone who clearly needs to be gone from the company, but also, as you mentioned, has information that everybody needs. And anything else that's on your radar that you're looking for, Amy? I mean, obviously, he's got the task at hand. Uh, whether you know this is a tale that we have to wait 10 years to see the end remains to be seen, but probably not. So what is it that, that is next in terms of what's expected by the public, the regulators, and others from him? Because he has to give us updates on what he's finding. Right. I mean, I think there there will be continued updates. There was, um, I'm sure you saw the first hearing this morning uh, in Delaware, and, and that made clear that Delaware will be the place where this is tried. Um, and so that's the, you know, that's a that's a first step. There will obviously be continued um, hearings in, in Delaware bankruptcy court and continued filings and and you know, we, myself and and, and all of our colleagues at Forbes are obviously going to be watching this closely. Great. Thanks very much, Amy.